Hey, welcome. Welcome, everybody. That's April there in the middle. That's Jennifer over on the other side. Hi. Hi, April. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Good to have you with us. Thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, appreciate it. Let's see. Um, just one announcement. Well, two announcements. Two announcements. One is, remember, there's no show Friday night for people who have that on the schedule. No show Friday night. And then for those of you who have enjoyed the squeak in my chair, it's gone. <laughs> I didn't know it was happening. Two people said, your chair's squeaking. It's all gone. So if you've enjoyed the squeak, I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. So, all right. So we're in Australia with April. And we're just going to get to it, April. I'm going to put you on full screen and um, good. let you have at it. All right. And introduce the uh, Sharon and, and Belinda. And off you go. So... Uh, there you are, full screen. Have at it. Um, full screen. There you go. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back to Gallery 76. And um, thank you for joining us again today. So um, a little bit different this time. I am uh, introducing two artists from Canberra. So that's um, the capital of Australia, for those of you who are not from here. Uh, Dr. Sharon Peoples and Belinda Jetman. I thank you for joining the exhibition with us today. It's an absolutely beautiful work. So I'm going to hand over to them and they can talk us through uh, the pieces. And any questions, I'll be passing it on to them. So let me put the camera around. Hi, all. Do you want to introduce yourself so they know who's who? Hi, I'm Belinda Jessup. And I'm Sharon Peoples. Fantastic. And you, um, Sharon's got the, the uh, majority of works in the front half of the exhibition. So perhaps Sharon could take us through some of her, her works. So in this exhibition, Exploring the Secret Garden, I took the idea of keeping something secret by covering your hands because it, when, you, when you garden, you get very dirty. So uh, this idea came about while I was making work but also was gardening at the same time. Last year in London, I saw a medal in the Garden Museum and the medal had uh, the ancient order of free gardeners. So there's a garden museum in London. London yes. So uh, that really started me thinking. It took a while to percolate through the work. So this piece here starts with that idea about the order of the free gardeners, but I've called it just the order of free gardeners. And I use a really basic plant, the uh, dandelion, and I use metal thread embroidery on this, working on soluble fabric. And I actually work in reverse because I have the metal thread in the bobbin. So whatever I do when I'm doing the metal thread lace, it's I'm having to do it always in reverse. Okay. Okay, April, um, April, April yeah. can, she, can she take us through her process when she says soluble uh, fabric? Just take us through. Can you take us through the process? Yes. yes. We do have samples for later. Oh, okay. So that, um, do then you never mind. Do an hour afterwards? Okay. We'll, we'll talk about it later because it's all soluble fabric, I think, um, a lot of the work. So okay. hold, hold that thought. Okay. <laughs> down, we're down, we're down. Mayday, mayday. Okay. Oh, dear. Where is that going to go? All right. Oh, goodness. Sorry, everyone. New technology is not doing good things to me today. Come on, come on. Hold still. <laughs> Oh, why are you turning off? Sorry, everyone. I promise we'll get it back together. It was doing beautifully before. Oh, come on. There we are. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. This is my fault. I'm still learning new technologies. Okay. Sarah, take it away can, with the second piece. Okay, so but I a, work April, with April, plants can you, in the garden yeah. and also insects. April, Sorry, Gary. can you go back to the first one and let us explore that a little bit, please? We want to explore the first piece a bit more. Yes, Absolutely. of course, of course. So, um, so I've used soluble fabric. Uh, I've drawn the design on, and then I have added some metal uh, silk organza for the top part because the fingers are very hard to work with. So this was one of the initial pieces. So uh, it's really trial and error, and over the 18 months that we've worked for this exhibition, uh, the work develops in much more sophisticated, technical way. Mm. So this is almost towards the end of the whole process where I'm using machine-embroidered uh, 
insects. These are bogong moths that come and migrate to our city in Canberra. And you know, they're part of the ecology of, um, of our gardens. Okay, so that was an earlier one you did, and this was a later one. Yes, that's right. um, the same process? For yes, both? using soluble fabric, and I lay it on top of the silk organza. Uh, I, you, in this case, making it more, using the soluble fabric more to draw the design on. Uh, and then that's all washed away, and I'm just left with the uh, silk organza underneath. And some of the moths are separately embroidered so that I add them on later. So are they doing the, is she doing this on a home sewing machine or a free motion machine or? Uh, a home sewing machine or a free motion? Yeah, it's a Benina sewing machine, but talking about the, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, but talking about what sort of machine, it really is a domestic machine um, and it uh, just free. I have to override the computer often and uh, just free uh, machine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and so do, are each of those moths then separate before she puts them together or? Um, so the question is, are each of those moths separate? I think the ones on top, those ones are and then the majority of them are stitched onto the glove um, before it's the sulfate, and then there's ones you can sort of see that are more raised are applied later, if okay. that makes sense. Yep. So, so you can see that. Yeah. So, um, and you can see this in the next piece very conveniently, which is a three-dimensional piece um, that she's done. Let me bring it down. So these are all individually machine oh embroidered. Oh and my. then stitched together, and I had to uh, make up a little mold to put it into a glove shape. So this is sort of the final parts of the, the whole process of the exhibition. So there's two of these in the exhibition. The other one was at the start with um, cabbage moss, which I can show you later. But wow. I think um, Sharon will show us her a trial and error process for putting that together later. Okay. Um, so I'll just give you a quick show, show of like the whole space. We've got a whole number of these gloves by Sharon and they're incredible, loads of different um, flowers and moths and creatures in those. And then we've got more larger works by Belinda at the back. So um, we'll keep taking you through the gloves, but if you get bored, let us know and we can switch to something else, okay? All right, no boredom so yeah. far. No one so far. Excellent. So, next piece for you, Sharon. This piece here, it looks much like an Elizabethan glove, and I was basing it on the gauntlet. Knights used to wear knights in armour, and gauntlets are the metal gloves that would protect their hands and their wrists. So, in this one, I used the metal thread embroidery to remind us about that idea of protecting the hands and in that gauntlet shape. So, I've used... Uh, a grevillea, a, a local indigenous plant, and I've used some of the flowers as uh, motifs for the pattern underneath, and then to make it very Elizabethan, making um, cording and tassels uh, to uh, replicate that, that idea. So it's doing battle against the garden is the idea, which I'm sure many of us can relate to. Wow. Oops, oh God. <laughs> it's quite it's quite a concept on top of being just impressive yeah. needlework. I lost the So yeah, that's a beautiful one, the gauntlet. And um, next along we have a pair of gloves, some gardening gloves, which are a bit um, less glitzy, a bit more sort of yeah, darkened. <laughs> I don't know, how would you describe it? Earthy. Them? Earthy, that's a good word for it. So what are these ones featuring, Sharon? Um, they're pods from our, our wattle tree, pods and seeds that just lie on the, uh, on the earth and it uh, just intrigued me. And so I drew these pods and trying to use it again in lace. And so uh, 
working on the solid fabric, but down here I've, I've attempted to make it more lace-like. It's, you know, recognisable at the top, but less like at the bottom. So Beth wants to know what kinds of threads are these again? Um, so Beth, I'd like to know what kind of threads these are. Uh, I use isocord threads uh, because one of the machines I have, the threads break frequently and I find the isocord machine embroidery thread is much stronger and I can choose from a huge range of colours and I now have a supplier that uh, makes it really easy for me. Okay. So it's machine embroidery thread specifically for the machine embroidery machines? Yeah, machine embroidery threads um, rather than the standard cottons or, yeah. Okay. All right. Nice. Um, this one's one of my favourite pieces because I love tulips. So this piece started off as a very colourful design in reds, yellows, um, purples, and it sat in my studio for six months. And I knew it wasn't part of this exhibition at all. Um, I was probably lamenting the idea that our flower festival is, uh, was cancelled this year, but still I had some coming up and I would like to acknowledge them. Then the, I had the idea of just toning it down into the metal thread. So I used a, a very yellow gold colour, a very green gold colour, a copper colour, and then the silver colours. And so you can see the variety that you get in bought uh, machine embroidery metal threads that are available. So this so is the blue pink. metal thread as well, that they're metal? Yeah, all metal threads, but working in reverse. So they're in the bobbin and having the bobbin very loose so to allow them to feed through very quickly. Okay. And use a complementary colour on the top. Yeah. I'm just impressed you can thread a bobbin, so I'm, I'm good at that, yeah. <laughs> Is that enough detail for everyone? Yeah, so we have basically uh, unopened tulips there at the top. Is that what that is? And then... At the, at the base, yeah. Yeah. So they're very tiny tulips. Yes. Yeah, okay. Wow. I'd like to wear these gloves, I think, to a fancy dress party <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're beautiful. Yeah. There's some very beautiful similar colours in this one. Using the same idea, I found an old scarf that belonged to uh, my sister. I was desperate for um, the organza. Uh, I couldn't get it. I had to order some through New York, and it took three weeks to get to Australia because of the slow postage at the moment. And I discovered I had this piece, this old scarf. And it worked perfectly well. And then I was really cross that I'd ordered, paid lots of money for <laughs> new fabric. So, again, that fine see-through organza and then using a copper metal thread, a gold metal thread and a silver metal thread. So that's a beautiful. So it's, it's re recycling as well as beautiful art. Yes. <laughs> Reduce, recycle, reuse, as they say. Yes. Beautiful work. Wow. Um, this is the one I posted on Instagram this morning, if anyone saw this one. This one is a cabbage yeah. moth gauntlet. Yeah, so anybody who's a vegetable gardener who fights the cabbage moths, we, they're introduced here in Australia, and I presume they're in America as well. So they love broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, and uh, they love landing on anything to eat them Green, and I've used the little grubs as well, green grubs, and I've used the grubs along the bottom. And uh, then individually stitch, although not, no, I've embroidered it all in one piece and then washed all the way the, uh, the space between, so making okay. a lace. So these weren't made individually, these no. ones. They were at, they were all done together and then the soluble fabric was dissolved. Yes. Okay. yes. So I had to make sure they're all connected. Oh, wow. Don't want a moth washing away in the <laughs> Those are so pretty. And that's all done freehand with the machine then? Yeah, it's, it's all freehand, isn't yes. it, Sarah? Yeah. yeah. 
So I use the sewing machine like a drawing tool. So instead of the pencil moving when you're drawing, the pencil is static and you move the paper basically. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. So do you have a foot on it or do you use one of those hopper feet? Or um, so do you have a foot or do you use a hopper foot? What do you what, what kind of foot do you use? Um, I use a I was using a quilting foot, but it's too high and I actually had lots and lots of trouble. Um, and I got a new machine, and with that machine was a really good darning and embroidery foot that oh. made it much firmer, and I haven't looked back since. <laughs> oh, nice. Um, uh, quickly zoom in on this beautiful little piece. So this is very similar to one of the ones in the start, the, the dandelion. So I might just quickly, but beautiful metallic threads, really sparkles, this one. And that's the, the gardening magic coming out of the finger, which I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is another pair of cabbage moths, and they're a lot lacier than the gauntlet. Yeah. Instead of colouring in, I have just used uh, the thread to indicate in the most minimal way mm. that I can. It's more of an outline on these ones. Oh, I see. Uh-huh. And again, a lovely sort of shimmering organza. That's lovely. <laughs> These are all for sale, by the way. This one is $400 framed. Just to point that out, that anyone who falls in love with a piece can uh, give, me a, give me a call. Um, okay, here's our <laughs> next Bogon moth piece, um, where the moths are being, what did we decide earlier? They're being helping hands in the garden. So again, um, connecting them all, and there's a little bit of lace work between, but it's all embroidered in one piece. Um, and the, the organza is separate, from, in a way, from the bottom, so that um, it's a little bit more solid up top. So how long does it take for you to stitch each piece or put the, it together? Uh, if I was really naughty, I could do them in two days, but that's stitching full time and not break, having breaks and whatever. Uh, and sometimes I do do that, it's silly, but uh, <laughs> generally, yeah, about a couple of days at least. It, and that would include washing it out and drying. So often I wash it overnight and I don't know what it's like until the next morning. Mm. Oh, so you soak it overnight in the... Mm. Soak it overnight in the... I, I just use a, a shower head. Uh, in summer, I can do it outside, and I pin them all on foam board, and I use what we call baking paper between the foam board and the fabric. And sometimes it's the garden hose. If it's a really large piece, I've made pieces four metres long, <laughs> and I've just had to um, hose it in the garden. Yeah, so it looks oh, like you're doing wow. gardening. You're really gardening your own <laughs> garden works. It's yes. very meta. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is some golden bottle brush. Bottle brush is a very um, classic Australian plant. A lot of these are um, typical Australian um, native plants, but sadly they're, they're not gold. <laughs> but they're they're very beautiful, very robust flowers. Um, and then we've got another order of free gardeners medal. Um, bring that one around. And that's um, – well, these just these were just sort of straight leaves, weren't yes. they? Yes. So beautiful lacy effect on those. So and it, they cast a lovely shadow. Sorry, Gary. Go. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're there it looks like we're building up layers. Yeah, we're building up layers. We've got two layers here. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So you've just done one or the other, and it makes that kind of nice three-dimensional look. And how do you get the shape to the top one, or do you just sort of pin it like that? Yeah, I just pin it like that. Okay, so it dries. Yeah, it shape. dries. It dries oh, okay. the shape you want. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this one actually shows I've worked with layers. I've, I've machine embroidered the leaves first, and then the metal thread on a different piece uh, because sometimes it gets a little bit confusing. So um, I've realised that it does work technically better if I uh, embroidered two layers. 
displays here. So are those mounted on boards with pins or is that sewn down or? They are stitched onto the boards, which are sort of oh, the back yes. of the frames. Oh, so okay. just, just sort of tucked, you know, caught down at a couple of key points. Right. You just see a stitch in there, but it's, it's very subtle. <laughs> Wow. They, they look like they're floating sort of in the frames. A yeah, bit. they do. That's why I was wondering. April, can we go in, go in close on yeah. that one again, please? Absolutely. Just to see the, the layering she's got in there. Let's give the camera a chance to focus. Oh, yeah. And then working different colors in there, too. So, so, yes. we're, so we're changing thread as we go through this thing. Um, are we changing thread or are you just layering pieces of different colors? No, thread? changing thread the whole time, um, many, many times. So that, <laughs> that, that is uh, time consuming. Um, I had a very big commission of fabric for um, upholstery and in my day, 30 to uh, 30 minutes an hour, I, was, I calculated changing threads each time you know it takes 30 seconds or a minute but that in over a whole day it actually adds up wow i mean he's not want to thread a needle so you know i can <laughs> sympathize there so that right. is the whole um on most of the glove series there's two pieces she's done that are uh, pairs of gauntlets so the sort of wider gloves and they are gorgeous i'll quickly show you these before we hit belinda's work so oh my uh, this is a a pair of gauntlets, um, Revilia Robusta uh, is the plant, and uh, it's got this charming um, little, what kind of bird was it? Wattle bird. A wattle bird. So let me just zoom in on that for you. So do the metal threads, are they metallic threads or actually metal, and do they fray? Or um, are the metal threads actual metal? Or yes, yes, they're metal threads, uh, wrapped thread. Uh, it's, a lot of it is made in Japan, uh, and uh -huh. now a lot is made in China. But these were quite heavy uh, metal threads, and I let that, uh, particularly this one, I uh, let the water do its own job, and it distorts very much. Um, usually I used to pin everything down to make it perfectly flat, but I have learnt to let it distort now and have confidence that it distorts in sort of the right way. Mm. And wow. the little threads never unravel? Uh, they haven't so far. Okay. I think it's part of that. The soluble fabric is, has sort of a gluey effect. Mm. Hmm. And they're made to go in a sewing machine? Um, and those threads are made to go in a sewing machine? Yes, they're metal machine embroidery. Oh, threads. wow. So, didn't know, know such a thing existed. Machine embroiderers, good news. Um, and this is the final piece of pairs. Uh, these are banksias, and banksias are another traditional Australian flower. If you've ever read the um, Snuggle Pot and Cuddle Pie series, it's a very uh, classic Australian children's book. And the banksias are the, the big bad banksia men. They're the, the bad fairies in the book. But these are not bad fairies. These are beautiful golden and green banksias in these sort of Elizabethan gauntlet designs. Where did she get the inspiration for using soluble fabric and embroidering this way, coming up with this idea? Um, Sharon, where did you get the inspiration for um, your soluble fabric? Um, I used it many years ago. I had a piece of work in uh, the uh, Powerhouse Museum's Lace Award, and that was in 2011. And I was determined to get into this award, and I thought how I could make my work really distinctive was using metal threads. So I spent many years developing techniques, and uh, finally I felt, feel really comfortable using this technique. And it's just trial and error. And I used to buy the soluble fabric in metre lengths, and my su uh, supplier said it was much cheaper to buy it in 100 metre lengths. And I thought, how would I ever get through that? <laughs> and when I bought that, I experimented far more because mm. I didn't just have one metre, I had many metres. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm up to the third 100 metre roll now. Yeah. And that's how you oh, end wow. up losing a piece in the garden. Exactly. I yeah. <laughs> exactly. 
And can you zoom in on the last one again? People want I to see the last, on the one, last one So, oh, thanks. Yeah, just, just dwell on that one for a little bit, April, so we can take in what's going on there. Because <laughs> when the camera focuses, then we get to see all the texture. It's really quite, Good. quite amazing. Yeah. Wow. I'll put together a catalog and um, send it to you as well so you can get some nice photos with close-ups. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was trying to understand why it was taking so long, but when you see all the color changes, uh, yeah, very time-consuming. And to get, get them right, yeah, I can see now why, why days go by putting these together. Yeah, it's quite subtle, the color changes. Yes. But there's so, like, even in this little bit here, you can just see so many thread colors. Yeah, that's why I just wanted to dwell on it because then you really come to appreciate the subtle shading she has in there. Yeah, they're gorgeous. Um, so if um, it works for you all, I think we might bring you around the corner and um, the lovely Belinda can show you a couple of her works, okay. um, which are very different all over again. So Belinda, um, why don't you shock us and tell us how long this piece took? Um, this large piece, which is titled Mulga Moon, which is an Australian um, tree, and it is at, um, just at sunset when the moon's rising, um, it's taken in the outback of New South Wales where I grew up. Um, but this piece has 26,600 squares to it, and it took me a year to produce. Mm. I'll just zoom in on these squares. That was 26,600 squares. And you can see again, it is produced on the water-soluble fabric, the same as Sharon uses. Oh, um, wow. And what I do to start with, I stitch a grid. I'll just quickly, I'll just quickly show them the squares. So it's a, yeah, um, 26,600 squares. So you start by stitching a grid on, onto the fabric. Yes. The fabric's not quite wide enough, so I have to join. This is two lengths of fabric um, in width. Um, so I join it up, but I construct a grid to hold it together because when you wash the fabric out, um, if you haven't interlinked everything, it will fall apart because you'll just have a pile of thread. There's nothing for it to, to hold together with once you've stitched it, once you've washed it out. So. Um, if you look carefully, you can actually see that there is a, a very light grey grid behind it. Um, so so that, that takes that takes quite a while just to grid it up to start with. So you grid it with a, a light grey thread? Yes, so just you... with the sewing machine. I'm um, just standard stitching, just on a normal. Um, again, I use a domestic um, sewing machine yeah. um, and just normal sewing. You know, just sew rows and rows and turn it in rows and rows. And how do you get them so beautifully precise and geometric? Oh, well, you know, that all started. <laughs> Lots of experimentation and then suddenly I thought, there's a quilting guide that you can get that attaches to your foot <laughs> and you just measure it across and then you just follow the guide. Okay, quilters, you only decided to know this. <laughs> <laughs> After I measured up and nothing would be quite right, it was, it was never quite square on all the test yes. pieces I did. And then, you know, it takes a little while for the brain to kick in and you look through your attachments to your sewing machine mm -hmm. and you find what you need. Love it's it. there all along. Mm -hmm. it, it's so beautifully geometric. It looks it looks digital in some way rather than mm -hmm. stitch. Mm -hmm. So, um, so April, that, uh, so she's using a, really a pixel, pixel effect to make this come together. Can, can you zoom yeah. in, show us what I she's doing? I'm zooming in on those pixels. So do you know how many thread colors you have here? Um, I think there's something like 62. Okay, so 62 thread colours. Different colours all across, so. Wow. And they're all interconnecting threads because I think if you, if you missed one, there'd be a hole, is that correct? Yes, yes. If you don't join um, each square on all four sides, you'll have a hole or your thread will wash away. So you kind of have to overlap a little bit on each edge as you're sewing? Yeah, there's a slight overlap on each edge, is that yes. correct? So they, yes. yes. Okay. Each one um, touches the colour beside it, so you get a, a slight blending of colour on the joins. 
Wow. And we'll zoom out so you can just see how that grows into that one big piece. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. So the, the and it must be must be a lot of work close and then back up to see if it's working going on. Yeah. So is, is there a lot of like going close and then backing up to see that it's working as you go through the process? I think there's a lot of praying. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have, and I can show you later. I do have a printout that I follow, and how I do it after I actually um, sew or grid, then I make a key of my design and I have to plot every individual square to a colour and then I go and, and I do it in sections. And how do you do that? Is there a, do you just look at the photo or is there a... Uh, so I print, print out a, a pattern. Okay. Or, yes, yes, you can um, generate a pattern. There you go. And okay. print it out. Amazing. So I print it, print it out just like a bit like a cross-stitch pattern yeah. um, would be and you then put your key across the design and I only do it in small sections and I yeah. mark it with a pen that is actually used for Sudoku crosswords, which <laughs> washes out. There's a lot of Japanese happening. <laughs> Japanese thread, Sudoku. We're actually sponsored by Japan here, apparently. So it was just a, a lucky find that another embroiderer told me about um, that you could, because you can't use something like a texter on it yeah because that was marker for those of you in the states yeah, yeah. <laughs> we call them texas right. here um because that is um wet and it will just put a hole where you've actually touched the, yeah. the fabric because the soluble fabric is quite fragile mm -hmm. yes we'll show you some samples in a yeah. second mm -hmm. um do you want to show us the little piece of, um yeah. same same Go. technique same technique again, and this is a waratah. It's a frilly waratah. It's a different kind of waratah to the general one that is known for Australia. And not like Sharon, I um, can't remember the actual proper <laughs> botanical name for that waratah, but I can look it up. Um, and this one only has about 13,000 squares in it. So, okay. But it is, again, done basically in the same technique. So how long does 13,000 squares take you versus 26? Thousand, well, is. this one took about three months, but I did on both of them. Um, the last bit of this, I took two weeks off work yeah. and I sewed 12 hours a day. So you're also being naughty, just like Sharon. Yes. Okay, it's, not, it's not a good thing to do for the body. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you really need to take your breaks and look after yourself. And how long did the, the big big one took over 12 months? Wow. Yes. yes. So did know. these start with photographs? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they both started with photographs that um, yes. you took, or your friend took that one, I think. My friend said. took this one um, from out west where I grew up, and this is one I took in the National Botanic Gardens in Canberra. Fantastic. Wow. Mm -hmm. hey, April, yeah. April, can you go in on that smaller one a little closer, please? I can indeed. Let me get some, some beautiful colours happening here. Yes. Oh, there we go. Look at that. So does she always do the same size squares or does she like to change it up? That's a good question. Do you do the same size squares always? Um, at the Is it based on your, your sewing machine's foot? <laughs> no, at the moment there, um, this one, the Waratah is a tad smaller than the tree um, in the squares, but it, it doesn't matter. The smaller you make the square, obviously the smaller your design will be and um, if you obviously make it bigger, it's a bigger design, but your picture will distort a lot more the bigger you go with your squares. Yeah. So right. it's just the same as if you have a photograph that you pixelate a photograph. Mm. Now, April, it looks like there's it's kind of a grid stitch going on there. Can you describe how the how the thread is placed? Is it just a up and down, left and right kind of thing? I think it is up and down, left and right. So once you've yes. got the square, you just do vertical and horizontal yes. stitches. Yes, it, it's very freehand. The same as same technique that Sharon uses is um, you drop the feed dogs on your machine um, or cover them up and put it in the, the darning mode, whatever your sewing machine does for darning mode. And it's in a hoop to keep it taut. And you literally just sew this way and then move that way. So, and okay. each square is done. Like you're panning from goals. That's yes. what I'm picturing. <laughs> so, you do each square complete, then move on to the next square. Okay. And carry, also, the next. 
do you carry to the next square or do you have to completely stop, cut your threads and start fresh on the next one? Okay, the question is, do you carry to the next square or do you just stop and start afresh? Does that depend on the thread colour that you're using and if it's changed? Yes, yes. So um, even though this, quite a bit of this is the same colour in here, each square was still done individually. So I would do one colour, one square, move across, do the next one, this one. But here I'd do these and then I would just pull the thread across, do this, do this, do this and cut the threads off at the back and the front where I've trained. So yeah, and you're not a masochist, you know, you have some like... <laughs> I try, yeah, to try and do a section and do each colour, the same colour in that section and then do the next colour in that section. Wow. It's like cross-stitch on a grand scale using a machine. <laughs> it is, isn't it? It's, it's amazing. Like mega cross-stitch. It's um, gorgeous. So, um, Belinda has Never another would piece, have thought of that. Which is, if these ones are very digital and sort of geometric, she has another piece here that is the complete opposite. So I'll swing you around to this beautiful piece, which is also machine embroidered, believe it or not. You want to talk us through this one here? Belinda? So this one's a garden wall. Um, looking at the secret garden as um, a rebirth, a renewal, that's secret guarded like the Francis Hodge, Hodgkin Burnett story. story yeah. yes. um, and it's a renewal. So this starts off with a very you know, dead garden um, and then it becomes into the re reverse renew of the garden that the, the children create. Um, so these are all done as an individual um, component. So And they are done in the machine embroidery in a hoop as an individual, and if you can imagine the old game that we all did when we were children with a spirograph, and you spin your hoop around, and then each one is cut out and dissolved and moulded over foam balls to give you an organic flower shape. Wow, that is gorgeous. Do you use the same foam ball, or do you just get a whole full of balls? Sharon graciously gave me her collection of foam balls, but I did have to go to our equivalent to the $2 shop yeah. and buy a lot more um, foam balls. <laughs> and my kitchen windowsill was constantly covered with foam balls with coloured bits on them. Yeah. <laughs> which my family gave up thinking I was quite strange. But, you know, <laughs> it became part of the house for the past 12 months. Yeah. Uh, and she painstakingly threaded all of these on um, to... Um, sort of an invisible fishing wire on a monofilament, which is like a fishing line yeah. yesterday. So there, um, a lot of work has gone into this piece. So she assembled that yesterday right there? She assembled <laughs> that yesterday on site, yep. Um, she had them all very well organized. I had them all threaded into their individual lengths at home and then transported them up, um, attached to foam foam boards and then attach them to the um, the hanging device at the top here in the gallery. So yeah, it was, it was a good day. So um, April, April, well, yes. April, you're not going to get away without going right in real close so we can see that. <laughs> we we got to see those I, up I, close. I'd never do that to you, Gary. <laughs> um, so wow. You can see the shadow of these ones on the wall as well. So delicate. So are are those metallic threads or just shimmery threads? Or? No, they're not metallic threads. They're just... Um, they're a machine embroidery thread. They're a machine embroidery thread. I think some of that shimmer might be from um, residue of the... Some is, yes. But it is quite a shiny... It is actually the same, uh, mostly the same thread that the big pixelated pieces are same with, but some is um, the isophil that... Um, the isochord that... Sharon uses is the same thread. Yeah, so but it does have a natural um, sheen. Right here, I'm going to zoom in on it. There's a tiny little, you can see, I can point it out, where is it? A little bit of um, filling. Residue. It's yes. right in the, right in here. See the residue. You see, see that? It's not really focusing. There yeah. you go. Might be it looks almost like um, like raindrops caught in it on, in a few oh, places wow. from the um, the bits of um, dissolved fabric that have, haven't fully dissolved. So, um, yeah, it's like a... It sets very hard. So once you've washed it once, 
you can't go back and successfully wash it again. There's, yeah, do it once right or, or not. Yeah. There's no going back. Oh, so the, the water soluble fabric acts kind of like a glue when you wash it. It makes it exactly, thick. yeah, yeah. It becomes a glue. So that's how that they get those nice oh. shapes because they can set them to dry in a in a ball or um, in a sort of three dimensional glove, however you want, and it and it's stuck that way. Oh, okay. You can see on the two these two pieces, this one hasn't washed out as much, so it's quite it's quite stiff, whereas this one is much softer. And this is washed oh. out more than this one. There you go. Wow. Um, so I might be bringing you around to our last selection of works, and then we can um, head to the, the front and um, get into some more techniques. Does that sound okay? Yep. Perfect. Okay, I'll bring you, Sharon can lead us through to the corridor where her final pieces are. So, so these are much more traditional machine embroidery on solid fabric um, and this was part of a residency I did two years ago in a very suburban area and I've used street maps underneath because it's a very car dependent area and beautiful uh, native gardens and I thought when I went there I would be using the lace technique and fragile gardens but people there grow really hardy plants. So I had to change my ideas and became solid. So this was in Brisbane, Australia, to have a very hardy plant garden. Yes, yes. Yeah, very Australian. Doesn't use much water and it uh, tolerates the heat as well as the cold. It gets down to minus eight degrees centigrade in Canberra. I have no um, idea what that is in Fahrenheit, I'm sorry. But it's, it's, it's below, it's below zero. freezing in, in, you know, <laughs> and very hot summers as well. Uh, so that's why the plants are very, very hardy. So that's why I use this technique. And it's a very hardy piece. When you, it's like, like we go with the, you know, if you scrunch it up, this, this thing is quite a solid um, piece of work. So. Like a quilt almost. Yeah, it is very much like a quilt. And you've got almost quilting stitches create this sort of um, almost like contours in the work. So this is all free machine quilting or would you call it embroidery? Yeah, quilting, yeah. This is our road map, and again for the um, U.S. contingent, these are magpies. These are um, Australian. Australian birds. They're um, they're beautiful. They sing lovely, but they are um, ratbags. I think is the the best way of describing them. <laughs> So that's that one. And then April, there's a April, April, yeah. April, I've got to ask you to explore that a little bit more here, just so we can take in all the things she has going on. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's sort of, the, let's go the full piece. And then I'll zoom in for you. There's just so much beauty in there. And earlier you were saying, Sharon, that the white sort of points in it, the white little round points, are representing hail. Because when you were there, we had it. You had a huge hailstorm. Yeah. Yep. So I've used that as a design device to bring it all together. Uh, we get huge hail in Australia, like rocks falling from the sky. What are you saying, Belinda, um, that your car was written off by hail just after a month of, of buying it? So. Oh. It, it, no. looks, it looks pretty in the picture, but it is quite destructive. Wow. So that's that one. And the next piece is a very similar technique wise, but you know, the colors just jump right out. I'll bring you over to this one. So if you uh, come close, you can see I use a zigzag stitch in this. Okay, and I'll in on that now. Uh... And I use a fabric underneath, it's almost, it's like an applique. And I use a double-sided um, uh, uh, Liza Flex, I think it's called, between them. So I've cut out these flowers and ironed them on and then machine embroidered over it. So I'm not doing it so intensely of pure stitch. I'm using fabric underneath. It's obvious where these legs are standing in the secret garden. And uh, it's just a quicker way of working for me. Okay, so more of applique in this one, but also with a lot of embroidery on top of that. 
but the colors are just spectacular. I think it's not what most people picture when they think applique. No. Yeah, and is that raw edge applique? She doesn't turn the edges over because she just embroiders over it? Raw edge applique? You yeah, raw edges. Yep, and you can sort of see some of those edges right. there. Wow. Above the bottle, are they bottle brush flowers that have the um, The bottle brush, yes. Those are beautiful. Yeah, and so that's that brand. So those are the two really big ones, and then we've got a selection of smaller, more contained pieces. Um, this one looks a lot like the first one in terms of the, um, the motifs of the road, the magpie, and the hail. And I think you said this one started out as more of a sampler. Yeah. Um, but became its own piece. So that's a really beautiful one right there. And does she use just commercial fabrics that she gets from just the store? Fabrics or yeah, yeah, nothing special. Yeah. Just plain <laughs> colored fabrics um, okay. and whatever I have in the studio. And particularly during <laughs> COVID, I try, uh, I didn't go out buying fabric and I um, just used entirely what was there. I think everyone got very creative in their storeroom in that in that time. Um, so what's the motif in, in this one here? Underneath here I've used uh, a water drain, um, just one of those industrially designed things you see in the street, but I was talking about uh, the way we use water in our gardens. And these are all introduced plants. There's Daphne, geraniums, fuchsias, blue plumbago. Um, and they you know, I have those in my garden as well as uh, native plants. Yeah. Yes, the non-natives do take up a lot more water. And uh, you can see them there. So is it, this one's a machine or is it applique? Yeah, oh, both. Both, 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 both machine okay. and applique. Okay. And then these also using the street maps uh, of the area I was working and layering the plants from the gardens. There. Oh, I love that. Okay, so the sort of squiggly lines are roads in the suburbs. Oh, okay. Oh, I see now what we're doing. I wasn't, oh, I wasn't yeah. getting this. Wasn't getting the street map thing. Okay. Okay. Well, there were sort of actual roads in some of the other ones, but. Oh. Oh. What a great idea for a you know to tie it all together. That's terrific. Mm. See, I think the sort of roads and gardens thing is. You know, it seems kind of opposite, but it's, you know, it's bringing that kind of that suburban lifestyle together with all the beautiful gardens that you see. Excellent. Excellent. No, okay. Lights went on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'll quickly show these last two pieces. And then I think Sharon and Belinda are going to show us um, a bit more of the technique behind um, putting these beautiful works together. So, oh, great. I'll bring you around now to our, our shop. And they've brought some samples to show us. So, one round. Um, I'll, if you mind, I'll stand on the side so I can see what's going on. So this is our our shop here in the in the gallery. And um, who wants to start? Why don't we? Well, um, here? I'm just showing. Um, the soluble fabric, here it is here. It looks like um, a lining fabric, but it's water soluble. And I've drawn on this for another design. Okay, and I was- on that and um, so it, lost it, lost it. Right. It does look exactly like, you know, backing fabric, doesn't it? Or, you know, uh, the iron on things you use for- Yeah. So in trying to get that three dimensional look, I made about five pairs. This was in the silk organza. Uh, this is in just beautiful uh, silk, making the patterns. And I had successfully made them in suede many years ago, but I couldn't get them to be uh, the way I wanted it. And so that's why I've gone for the flat shape uh, because this is just incredibly difficult. Um, so it's just part of the design um, technique that I wanted to show. But you did manage to create the three-dimensional ones. I did, eventually. So did you use a mould like this? No, then... I, I cut something out of foam and covered it in a soluble fabric so that if it got stuck, I could just wash it away. Um, and I had these foam fingers 
and I sewed all the uh, individual moths all over the foam and then uh, withdrew it. Okay, wow. Sounds complicated, but... Yeah. Zoom in on that design mm -hmm. there. And is your technique somewhat similar? Linda? It is quite similar. Um, I'll just show you, these are the threads that I use mostly, and mine are called Gem Threads. Um, that's just the brand that I, I buy. And these are the ones that Sharon uses, and I use these as well, but mostly I use those. Mm, they do have that nice kind of sheen to them that you were talking about, Rachel. Mm, great. Yes. So when I started out on the, the big tree pieces, I first started trying to decide how I might stitch it and this was one of the first samples I did and as you can see it's very thick very heavy um, and not you know not successful um, at all using different colors in the bobbin as well as the top um, then I moved on to a bit more playing here um, just what I might get to do then I got to this and I think this was where I first decided the lighter way was the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, my sample books are quite a mess. I've always <laughs> got lots of things glued in and it's just the way I, I work. Drawings, more colour testing, testing there. This was another way I tried working was um, a freehand grid on the water-soluble fabric again, putting little bits, just scraps um, that were in the scrap bucket on it to see if this technique might work, but I didn't like it at all, didn't work. So these are eventual colour samples that I did. And you can see smaller grid ah, okay. comes out much smaller. So you can see when you put the two together, yeah. just the size of the grid, how it changes your yeah. design. So they were just colour Test, samples, just yeah. testing as, you know, before I started because I knew once I started 26,000 squares I had to have it right. Yes. <laughs> and here again, this is it on the fabric. Okay, so this is before you dissolve yes. the fabric, what it looks yes. like. So this is, again, and all I would do, Great. and it has to be in a hoop, um, nice and taut, okay. and you put it in upside down to hand stitching. So you would put it, this is a, a cheating style of hoop <laughs> that I found that I love. So you would have it, so instead of this would be the way you do it for hand stitching, mm -hmm. but on the sewing machine you do it this way so it sits flat on your on on the the machine. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, and so you need to have it taut because otherwise there's too much thread or it's it catch just, on the... It would just scrunch up. You, you don't have any control because you've dropped your feed dogs that normally control the right yeah the normal sewing and right. these are the yes these are the pens that i use for sudoku or for that's what i use for marking Love out it. Hmm. um so is and the um so solvate easy to work on does it catch or is it pretty sturdy no, while you're sturdy. working on it once you've got it in a hoop it's very sturdy i find yep and those are some little of your, your little flowers? These are just little flowers. These are just the components individually. Um, just depends. They got a bit squashed travelling yesterday. But they look yeah. a bit like colourful spiders now, don't they? They do. <laughs> so there you have it. There's the, the wow. secrets. Behind. Oh, hang on a second. This is the plant. I think we oh. all want to see this. <laughs> oh, my. So she's talking about the – this is very full on. Let me zoom back here. So this is 26,000 squares plotted on a map. <laughs> ah, wow. Okay, so let me get this straight. So she takes that, and then she takes a piece of fabric and puts yep. it in a hoop, and then on the machine, she's stitching squares in an area. Yep, one hoop space at a time, I guess, or oh my close to. Yes. Well, this would... I would sort of work and do this, then this, then this, sort of working your way across. That's mental. I did start thinking <laughs> I'd do one colour and I'd do a bit here and a bit here, but it became too unruly yeah. and hard to follow where you were going. So this yeah. is this is full coverage cross-stitch the hard way. 
Wow. It is. Yeah. yeah. The number number of symbols here. It, it's like it feels like the Matrix. You know. <laughs> the symbol is a color. Yeah. Just to it's keep like that. the heaven and earth design. Yeah. Mm. Just to keep that in your that's, head visually is. That's part of the um, wow. Waratah. This is the Waratah. Okay, this is better. I can actually see the symbols mm. in that one. The other ones felt almost invisible. So. There's your. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fantastic. Thanks for bringing that, um, Linda. It's, it really helps sort of you know, visualize the, the process there. So, I'm going to this round. Hang on a second. Bring you back into the gallery now. And uh, let's switch the camera around so you can see me again. Hi, everyone. I'm still here. Um, so, uh, does anyone have any other questions or things they'd like to see more? Burning questions for Sharon or Belinda? I'd, like I'd like to go back to the 3D glove, if we could, and just see what that looks like. I can actually go through the glove. It's actually the one that we haven't seen yet, the, the cabbage moth glove. I'll show you that one first. Okay. Put the camera on, Sharon, you want to bring us around. So this is the other one. In white. So these were individually stitched, and I actually have white fabric under that stitching. So And then I've cut each of those out, joined them up again, um, and into that glove shape. <laughs> oh, wow. And the fingers just. Amazing. So that's the cabbage moth one. And I'll um, bring you around quickly to the bogon moths because it's all about moths today, apparently. <laughs> yeah, to this one. So again, you can just see so many colours of thread in each individual moth. What I learned from a Sydney embroiderer was to put two and three colours in the same, threaded up on the machine. And uh, that gave, it worked much quicker, but it gave that variety um, and subtlety that I could, um, I wanted for these beautiful bogong moths. So that was a, a new technique um, that I came across towards the end. Oh, all going through one needle? All going through one needle? Yes, one needle. Okay, and the machine oh, wow. can take that, the yep. machine. Yep, it can indeed. There you go. Um, I never yeah, that, would have thought of that. <laughs> yeah, I know, I think I'd be very worried about it. Do you need to adjust the tension for that? Or I, is didn't. It? Nope. I didn't. I didn't. Oh just... my goodness. This is, this is the face of confidence, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> The, the learning process that they both went through as they developed their art is fascinating. Just working yeah. out how to how to deliver what they're trying to get. Yeah, a lot of trial and error and process, and I think that's sort of part of what makes it so beautiful is just, yeah. And a long period of time. That's, yeah. We've worked for a long time. Yeah, and it's it's very unique. So, yeah. Now, um, did, April, do they do do they work uh, kind of as partners in terms of sharing ideas and techniques, or are they completely independent artists? The question is: Are you uh, do you work as partners sharing techniques, or are you are you uh, solo agents in your creative process? Um, solo tends to, but we do meet up a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> share ideas. Yeah. Belinda would often call by on her way home from work. Um, normally, I wouldn't see anybody during the day when I'm working. I like to concentrate, but she would text me and say, I'm on the way home. Can I call in? And then we'll chat again. Yes, yeah, bring, I would bring pieces of my work and we sort of work out problems I was having or critique and great. ways yeah. to move on. Especially because you're both quite similar um, techniques in some way. There's a lot of yeah. crossover. You can kind of troubleshoot with each other and... Um, talk about yes, it. Yep. Yes, the technique is exactly the same, yeah. but we both work in very different way using that technique. Mm. Yes. There you go. Yes. Um, so hence the, the joint exhibition here. I think, yeah. I think their work's going to be yeah. cool together. Well, it sure is beautiful. Thank you, ladies. We really appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us today, and um, see, you, see you next month, hopefully. Okay, we'll plan on that. Thank you, April.
Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye, okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye.